I'm Dennis Daly. If you ever watch public television late at night, back in the 70s and 80s, you saw an energetic fellow with a mustache called Jack Horkheimer reporting from the Miami Transit Planetarium about what was in the sky that night. I can only find one of the many interviews I did with Jack, and you must know the noise of him inhaling so strongly is because he had lung problems all of his life, and that is what eventually ended his life in 2010. The first thing I wanted to ask Jack was how you separate astrology from astronomy, because at one time they tended to be the same thing. Today we have divorced astrology from astronomy because we know that one is a science and one is not a science. But uh, hundreds and thousands of years ago, astrology and astronomy were the same thing. The greatest astronomers were also the greatest astrologers. We, as a matter of fact, uh, we tend to forget that uh, uh, Copernicus and Kepler were also very, very involved in astrology. They were great, great astronomers, but their astrology uh, is what helped pay their bills. When we go back even just uh, a century ago in our own country, before, before technology really took off, we find not only a nation, we find a world of peoples who were very involved with seeing the night sky and using the night sky to interpret uh, their seasons the the way in a very familiar way the way we use uh, the weather forecast every night to interpret the local and global weather and so the stars were m much more a part of people's lives just a hundred years ago than they are today and when you can consider that the majority of this people on this planet uh, never had electric lights uh, never had the kind of technology we live with today uh, they became very closely attuned to the visual appearance of the heavens and that changing appearance of the heavens night from night and season to season it really became an integral part of their life as much a part of their life as as the uh, as the four seasons because there are seasons in the heavens well now you're you're not talking only about experts you're saying the average person um was maybe infinitely more aware of this night sky. I seldom look up at it. And, and many people living in big cities today, there are so many lights you can't see it. That is correct. A lot of people don't look up anymore because they, they feel no need for it. We have no real connection with the stars. Uh, the way people see stars today is on television. Uh, or if they are prompted to... Uh, uh, think about it through the discoveries of high-tech spacecraft and our latest space technology that's more forced to think about but still that 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 kind of science becomes very external to people it isn't internalized it isn't personalized we really have lost a great part of our heritage an incredible part of our heritage there's such a thing that I refer to as the celestial environment which I think is as emotionally and uh, important is important to the psyche as the terrestrial environment. Uh, although I've been a Floridian for 26 years, uh, and I now see the subtle changes of the seasons in South Florida, I was born and raised in Wisconsin, where I was finally attuned to the changing of the seasons as people are. They become an integral part of your lifestyle. You dress, you, uh, you, your, you the whole economic system of the North is based upon the four seasons, the, the changing of clothes, the, 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 the need for fuel, the different kinds of foods. This was much stronger before technology. And before the invention of electric lights, uh, nature played a very important part at night in public activities. I remember my grandmother, my grandmother Foley up in Wisconsin when I was a kid. I remember she told stories about about uh, going to on dates and going to dances and town meetings and it took me years to realize when I got very involved in the lore and the lure of the heavens which is really what I love as much as the science uh, I found it fascinating I remember her stories about how when they would go out for dances in the spring or summertime they would go by horse and buggy of course but we we completely forget what it was like back then because we haven't really got a personal association with this unless you happen to have had a relative who tells you about this and even then it's a storytelling kind of a thing 
And she told the stories about how, you know, when they go out, of course, they always went by moonlight. And then I realized that why did they have monthly town meetings? And when did these monthly town meetings occur? And you know why they occurred? And when they occurred? They occur at the time of the full moon because that's the only time people could really see to move any place with their horses and buggies. They didn't have great, tremendous lanterns to see in the country. So they, they had their social events constructed around fair weather during the time of full moon. I asked Jack Horkheimer of the Miami Planetarium about the popular conception that people go wacko every time there is a full moon. Again and again and again you hear people talking about reports of people getting crazy during time of full moon. And statistics do not bear this out, no matter what you heard. Statistics from police departments do, do not uh, fit in with, you know, weird behavior, more weird behavior in the time of the full moon, except for this one thing. People have asked me, you know, why is it that people go crazy during the time of the full moon? They assume that this happens. It has something to do with gravity and the pull of water. Well, frequently the moon is full. The moon's farther away from us, so it has less gravitational pull upon our body, so it does not affect us that way gravitationally. But the interesting thing is if we think again historically and pragmatically, the weirdos would go out when everybody else goes out at night. If people only go out at night en masse to dances or to town meetings, the weirdos go out with everybody else. So there are more weirdos out during the time of the full moon, and more normal people are out during the time of the full moon, okay? Uh, why was there more crime in London historically during times of the full moon? Well, before they put in gas lights in small towns, there is more crime during time of the full moon. Um, more horse thefts in, historically, more, you know, uh, more pickpockets in the streets. Why? Because at time of the full moon, that's the time that people were out on the streets. Why is a pickpocket going to go out on nights when there's nobody out there whose pockets are to be picked? Sure. So we have these fables that we have tried to turn into science, into bad, cheap science. And really, the, the, the simplest explanations, the, the most obvious explanations, are the true explanations. People historically, more weirdos were out, more crime was committed at time of full moon because that was the time when things were illuminated at night and that people could go out to rob and pillage and commit crimes and when the weirdos went out. Now, we can take this back further, not just a hundred years, but thousands of years, and we find out that people who live by the seasons, if you know that in the springtime you have to plant the crops in autumn, you have to reap the crops, and this is what keeps you going. This is this is this sustains life, the whole culture of Egypt and the Nile. The your, your annual flooding of the Nile was all calculated to sustain life. If you don't grow the crops, if you don't reap the crops, you don't have food, you die. <laughs> Egyptians used the star C as Sirius, the brightest star in the heavens, the eye of the great dog, Conus Major, uh, just below Orion, the hunter we see it every winter. And uh, um, the Egyptians knew that when this star had a heliacal rising, they knew that that was the time that the, the Nile was going to flood at that time in history. Now, heliacal rising is very simple. It seems it means it rises before the sun. People watched the sunrise. They were up with the chickens and they were up with the cows because the animals were up and they were out before dawn. So, historically, when the Egyptians, at the time of year, they went out before dawn and they saw the bright star Sirius rise over the eastern horizon just before the sun rose, that was the time of the year when the Nile was getting ready to flood and they got their preparations ready. Now, there are a hundred, not a hundred, thousand examples like this, how people use the sky, the physical appearance, aspects of the sky in order to regulate their lives. Now, if you regulate your lives by the seasons, we, we, we see springtime, can we plant our crops? Not only do you have life-sustaining activities that are tuned to the seasons, but you also eventually, because we are, are human beings, Beings, we, we tend to uh, culturize everything. Uh, we tend to make everything part of our, our, our whole value system and, and uh, subjective system. We take the ob objectivity and we, we make it. We take our objectivity and we become subjective about it. Uh, so if indeed we, have, we see spring as a time when we have to work and plant crops, you also see spring in all its poetic sense, in its beautiful sense, in the spiritual sense. So the stars were the same way. They used the stars to regulate, to help regulate and tune the seasons, to account for their year. That's how early time clocks were, were, were kept. We completely forget or are unaware of the fact that our year is simply based upon one cycle of our Earth going around the sun. And this is very easy for people to observe by watching the sun pass through the, through the stars in the heavens. They measured it took 365 and a quarter days for the sun to go through all the signs of the zodiac, completely make one circle around the sky. We completely forget that our word for month is an ancient timekeeping mechanism. It was based on a scale of 29 and a half days. Our word month actually is the time that it takes for our moon to go from one full moon to the next full moon or from one new moon to the next new moon. 
Our word month actually was originally spelled with two O's and it was called a month. We do not realize this day. As a matter of fact, all the days of the week are named after planets. There were seven visible planets in the heavens uh, at the time of the ancients and they considered the moon and the sun as part of the planets. For instance, Sunday is very obvious name for the sun. Monday was named for the moon. Now, some of the names that we have of the other days of the week uh, have been, have been um, uh, come from the, from the German and from the, the Norwegian, but in different languages, the names are actually for the planets. For, you know, Mars Day and, and, and Friday. Uh, we have Saturday, which is Saturn Day. We are totally unaware in contemporary times that we live by a very ancient system that used the heavens as a vital part of life's mechanism and life's everyday activities. How differently people perceive the heavens 2,000 years ago than they do today. If we go back thousands of years ago, you and I and everybody else is going to be finally attuned to the heavens. The heavens are, in fact, the oldest library in existence for the planet Earth and for planet Earth's cultures. Many of the of the legends of the histories of peoples have come down to us directly through the stars. This has nothing to do with astrology or mysticism or spiritualism, nothing misty and spooky, eerie, weird, supernatural. It is natural. You see, before the invention of writing, People are the same as we, we are. The same it, it, People who are illiterate today are exactly the same as we are. And people are the same thousands of years ago as we are today. Same feelings, same emotions. And they had the same desires to pass on their identities, to achieve some kind of immortality through verbal history, pass on their, 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 their value systems, their history, pass these things on to their children. If there was no writing, how could they make sure that this would happen? How, how, would, they, how would their children remember these stories? Well, in ancient times and still today in certain tribes around the country that are isolated in, in the jungles, Fathers and mothers would take their children out under the stars at night, and they'd see, see that little group of stars there. Well, if you kind of draw imaginary lines between these stars, it looks kind of like this kind of a thing, a figure. It may loosely resemble a figure, very loosely, like, a, like, a, like an abstract painting sometimes. But they'd say, now, I want you, when you see that group of stars, I want you to tell your children about this person in our history, a great warrior, a great hero. Perhaps you'll see a horse over here. This is the horse of a great king who ruled many years ago and who made our land free or whatever. This might be a, a, a figure over here of a great queen who once ruled. People populated the entire heavens with their heroes, their mythologies, and their gods so that they could pass these things on to their children with some kind of assurance. There were no books, there was, there was no writing. It is an enormous canvas that had been painted a thousand times. And the fascinating part about astronomy today, visual astronomy, is that today there are experts in the field who are going back in, uh, we call, there's a whole field called archaeoastronomy. We are going back and trying to de decipher the cultural heritage implanted upon the canvas of the heavens by all different societies. This is a fascinating part of astronomy today. And as nationally known astronomer Jack Horkheimer tells us, 2,000 years ago it was a different time. The average man or woman knew infinitely more about the stars than we do today. And the experts watched the stars. The Magi went to Bethlehem. The three wise kings, but were there three? The whole story of the Magi is rather complex. If you go throughout uh, history, you find out that there weren't, you know, three Magi. History depicts everywhere from one to twelve of them. Uh, the three Magi were, were, were set the number of three hundreds of years after the event. And, of course, the Magi were not uh, kings. They were astrologer, astronomer, priests. We believe that the, the our word magician comes from the word Magi, magician, magic. They were astrologer, astronomers who advised, we believe, some of the kings of Arabia. Uh, probably in the areas of Petra and south of there. We're not quite sure where they came from. Astronomy has found out that uh, certain planetary alignments, which was quite significant to people who studied the stars, occurred at that time and would have indeed, indeed in that time, in, in the cultures of that time, have sent astrologer astronomers on hunts uh, for, for new kings, for um, 
propitious events to happen. This would not have been unusual at all. Even though we see Jack Horkheimer every night on late night TV on the public broadcasting system, on his star hustler show, things might not have been that way. He started out wanting very much to be part of the opera, but then something changed him. Something he heard one night on television when an Indiana TV station was about ready to sign off back when he was in college. I loved the stars as a child. I loved the legends, but I had not connected. I had not subjectively really become so involved that I, I realized for a moment that I was a part of the stars. I didn't realize that until I heard a Jewish rabbi when I was in college. It was at Christmas season, as a matter of fact, and it was snowing outside at Purdue University, and I stepped outside. I was going through a bad period of my life. I remember going outside and feeling very alone and uh, rather existentialistic uh, type of my life when I really didn't have any belief in anything. And I heard this voice come on as they were tuning, going off the, the TV for the night when they used to do these prayers at the end of TV. You know, I don't think they do that anymore around the country. The last thing at night, some local preacher, some local priest or rabbi gets on and says a few words, most of which is really, you know, really bad preaching. But I heard coming down from the upstairs as I sat, walked outside in the snow and looked up at the heavens. I was just looking at the stars, smoking a cigarette, having a drink in one hand. This rabbi said, wonder and awe is the only form of prayer suitable for any creator in any universe. And as I was looking at the stars, I had this incredible sense. I saw them three-dimensionally in my mind as external things to the earth, placed at different spots away from me, like signposts on a road that you're traveling down. When you're traveling down a highway, you see billboards, signposts, houses, cows, chickens. I suddenly realized that I was riding on the outside of a planet. I'd known this intellectually, but I felt the emotion. I was riding on the skin of a planet, a spaceship, so to speak. A spaceship almost five billion years old, along with millions and millions of other passengers on really a cosmic spaceship. And that although these planets, these stars, were far away from me, nevertheless, I was a part of it, an intrinsic part of it. And I felt such incredible awe, a sense of awe and wonder at the mystery of it, at what we will never be able to know that I suddenly connected again somehow. I connected with it. I feel like a part of it. Like, uh, you realize that, you know, you live, you die, you're part of Your atoms remain at all times. They cremation through your ashes in a lawn. You may show up as a blade of grass. You may show up as a daisy, a petunia, or an onion, or maybe a clove of garlic. But you do show up someplace sooner or later on this planet. You keep, you know, your elements return to nature, and you show up as something or other. Um, that, I think, propelled me into wanting to kind of share that kind of an experience with other people. In the same way, I think that a composer wants to share music. I have a compulsive, obsessive, almost manic need to turn people onto the stars. The way I used to want to turn people onto music when I was a young man, I was uh, crazy about the music of Richard Strauss when I was a young boy. I feel a compulsive need to turn people onto the stars because it produces such a satisfying experience in fellow human beings. And of course, part of the human journey of all of us is to share the things that we find beautiful. And I have found that sharing the stars is what I do best with people. It gives me kind of a raison d'etre. It really kind of justifies my being here to myself. It's also exciting to watch little children and old people alike get thrilled by something that's always there and always has been there and tune them into it. And it's accessible. It's free. Oh, it's the greatest show in the universe. They, they, the, the universe is the greatest show in the, in the universe, <laughs> and, and it is indeed free. Uh, you don't have to know science, and you don't have to know anything about anything about astronomy. As a matter of fact, I spend a lot of my time demystifying astronomy, making it accessible, taking the language of the professionals and turning it into the language of the street. I prefer myself as, as kind of an, a street astronomer, uh, as my friends used to come as the Julia Child of the Heavens, <laughs> or the street version of Carl Sagan. <laughs> Some moments with the late head of the Miami Transit Planetarium, Jack Horkheimer, who told us all to keep looking up. I'm Dennis Dale.